Joe Biden wants to be president, and given the alternative, Americans should probably let him. This fact seems to please centrist liberals for some reason. Joe Biden is seen as a return to normalcy, going back to the halcyon days of the Obama administration. And things are definitely really bad now, so I get why people want to kick the new guy out. Trump is terrible, no doubt, and Obama was slightly less terrible. So that's something, I guess. But I would think that the prospect of going from terrible back to slightly less terrible, but now a little bit more terrible than that, because it's not actually him, it's his running mate, that would make people question whether or not they actually lived in a democracy. Probably, though, the reason they don't consider it a problem is because they don't think Obama was that terrible. I mean, Republicans think Obama was terrible, but they think he's terrible for the absolute worst reasons. Centrists and libs love him. They think he's the bee's knees. And it's not hard to see why, I guess. He's charming, handsome, witty, and probably one of the best orators in a generation. He's the first African-American president. That's a hell of a progressive sounding thing, isn't it? Doesn't hurt that he's sandwiched between the two most contemptible presidents in living memory. Except maybe this guy. He's the perfect politician, except for the teensy detail that he's a carefully manicured fraud and a mass murderer. Simply put, these strikes have saved lives. So if 75% of those Americans that have been killed in drone strikes were not specifically targeted, what does that mean for the thousands of Pakistanis, Yemenis, and Somalis that have also been killed in drone strikes? Well, look, this is a country of 300 million people. I, 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 do, I do not believe that the only person uh, who's qualified to be the chief of staff of the Treasury Department is a Goldman Sachs lobbyist. We tortured some folks. It's difficult to imagine now, but this guy seemed like an outsider in 2008. Some fresh-faced, bright-eyed newcomer who could take on the establishment and shake things up a little. His slogan during his first campaign was hope and change. And in case you didn't get the message, he also had change you can believe in. In retrospect, that was a really fitting slogan. It was change you could believe in, not change that we will enact, or even change that is likely. It's an invitation to believe a change is coming, but no promises. And there were plenty of reasons to want a change, to hope for it, even. America was embroiled in two pointless quagmires in the Middle East that showed no signs of stopping, and the economy cratered harder than it had since the Great Depression. The latter is a complicated problem that I only sort of understand the details of, but the long and short of it is that huge finance companies were left unchecked and gave a bunch of loans and credit to people who they knew couldn't pay it back. Then they took those toxic assets and bundled them with other good assets and sold them to other finance companies or something, and that hurt the money. The money didn't like that when they did that, so the money went away. The details aren't important. What you need to know is that everybody knew this was a problem. Everybody knew the bubble was going to burst someday, and nobody did nothing about it because the assholes doing it were making enough money to buy them off. And not like, directly, mind you. Nobody handed a politician a, a big bag of money with a dollar sign on it. They just like, funded think tanks and the economics departments of important schools and subtly raised the profile of advisors to power and maybe formed a few super PACs to kick money to whatever candidate would pass the legislation that they wanted. So okay, that's not great, right? Like it seems like one thing you'd want is the people who knowingly did that to make money, fully aware that the livelihood of thousands of innocent people would be wiped out, should get punished. You'd think that if there was a guy currently campaigning for president, who was saying, hey, everybody, we gotta change stuff. We need a bunch of change, if you ask me. Change is, is what I'm gonna do, if you know what I mean. You'd think that that guy would hold the finance companies accountable and make it so that they couldn't just destroy the economy for fun anymore, right? So, like, if that guy got elected president because people wanted that, you probably wouldn't be happy if he filled up his cabinet with guys from the companies that did that. 
So if that guy's pal from his time at Harvard, Michael Froman, who is now an executive at Citigroup, one of the companies that destroyed the economy to make themselves slightly more astronomically wealthy, donated, I don't know, $200,000 to that guy's campaign, and then that guy's pal ended up in an advisory role to the transition team where he helped pick out that guy's finance people and didn't resign from Citigroup while he was picking out those people until he'd been doing it for two months. And then after he had left Citigroup, a year later, they paid him a $2 million bonus. And let's say also that this guy brought on another consultant named Jamie Rubin, who's the son of Citigroup executive Bob Rubin. Let's say that Bob Rubin was also the Treasury Secretary under Bill Clinton, and he repealed the Glass-Steagall Act specifically so the merger that created Citigroup could happen. That'd be a problem, right? And then if Citigroup managed to skate by with no consequences, and in fact, Obama's transition team negotiated with the Bush administration to get a massive bailout where taxpayers footed the bill for hundreds of billions of dollars of Citigroup's losses that were the result of investment decisions Bob Rubin made, and then the guy who was the architect of that deal, Timothy Geithner, became Obama's treasury secretary, and oh, by the way, happens to be the protege of Bob Rubin, You'd probably think, hey, Citigroup seems to be writing the rules here. And that's something that they shouldn't get to do. Because they hurt the money. They made the money go away. And that's just one example. You want a list of Obama appointees from Goldman Sachs? Treasury Secretary's Chief of Staff, Mark Patterson. Counselor to the Treasury Secretary, Gene Sperling. Acting Assistant Treasury Secretary for Financial Markets, Kathrick Ramanathan. Managing Executive of the SEC's Division of Enforcement, Adam Storch. Chairman of Commodity Futures Trading Commission, Gary Gensler. Hey, you know what else is weird? You know what's weird about all those guys from Goldman Sachs being Obama appointees? It's that Goldman Sachs was also one of the biggest donators to Obama's campaign and they gave almost a million dollars. And then, mysteriously, a bunch of their former employees got important jobs in the administration. That's weird, don't you think? Sure, they're taking all the money, but maybe they have a good reason for it. Maybe their grandmother is very sick and needs medicine that costs $200 billion. And yeah, I know they didn't just hand them a big check with $200 billion written on it. They agreed to take on the losses of $200 billion worth of toxic assets. There's no way to make that into a grandma analogy. Economists, log off. Anyway, if the finance stuff is as boring to you as it is to me, let's move on to the fact that Obama is also a war criminal. Now, before I get into this, it's worth pointing out that most, if not all, U.S. presidents are war criminals. And if you think that lets Obama off the hook as though war crimes are just an inevitability of the office, why are you okay with that? How can you lend your support to anyone who seeks an office where committing a war crime is mandatory? Now, maybe some small part of you considers what I would call war crimes, because that's what they are, to either be justified casualties in war or collateral damage that nobody could avoid. So, as I describe the things I'm about to describe, I want you to keep these questions in mind. Is this justified? And if not, could this have been avoided? Perhaps the most iconic of Obama's crimes is the escalation of the use of drone strikes that he allowed to blossom unchecked. During Barry's tenure, the CIA ran a secret program of drone strikes in Pakistan, a country whom you might note the United States was not and is not at war with. See also Somalia, Libya, and Yemen, where drone strikes have also been used by the United States for targeted assassination. And one might argue that killing people without a trial, when you don't even have the pretense of a war, is illegal. And the name of that crime is murder. Now, maybe the murder of suspected terrorists in other countries doesn't exactly scare you. Maybe murdering terrorists sounds pretty good, actually. And if you end up murdering a few people who end up not being terrorists by accident, or maybe on purpose just a little bit, hey, you can't make an omelet without extrajudiciously killing a few civilians. Just the smallest amount of civilians, barely any. Oh, hey, by the way, we're counting every man of military age who was killed by a drone strike as an enemy combatant, unless there was conclusive exculpatory evidence that they were not. And by the way, we're not going to publish their names so you have no way of checking on that evidence for yourself. A thing that people who were killing very few civilians would definitely consider it necessary to do. Just, just a small, maybe even no civilians, one or two, maybe. 
a few, a few dozen, a few hundred civilians, many of whom were children. Sorry, probably more, but we don't know because the White House isn't exactly forthcoming with these numbers, nor is the CIA exactly forthcoming with details on the drone program in Pakistan. In fact, White House policy was to deny the existence of that program until details were divulged to The Intercept by an anonymous whistleblower in 2013. One of the details being that a drone campaign called Operation Haymaker killed 200 people, only 35 of whom were intended targets. Again, this information was leaked. The administration chose to hide it. So the question of personal responsibility of a president for the actions of the war machine they command is a complicated one. But lest you think that Obama was a hands-off commander-in-chief whose subordinates carried out drone strikes either without his knowledge, approval, or consent, let me quote from the New York Times. Mr. Obama has placed himself at the helm of a top-secret nominations process to designate terrorists for kill or capture, of which the capture part has become largely theoretical. They just using some colorful language there, but what they mean by that is you can't exactly capture people with a drone strike. And the more you depend on them, the more you've committed to killing targets, which in turn radicalizes terrorists, making us all less safe. Mr. Obama is the liberal law professor who campaigned against the Iraq war and torture, and then insisted on approving every new name on an expanding kill list, poring over terrorist suspects' biographies on what one official called the macabre baseball cards of an unconventional war. When a rare opportunity for a drone strike at a top terrorist arises, but his family is with him, it is the president who has reserved to himself the final moral calculation. The Atlantic writes, in any case, Obama chose to allow the CIA, a secretive entity with a long history of unjust killings, to carry out strikes. He chose to keep the very fact of drone killings classified, deliberately invoking the state secrets privilege in a way guaranteed to stymie oversight, public debate, and legal accountability. And he chose to permit killings outside the greater Afghanistan war zone, in countries with which the U.S. was not at war. Those choices made more unjust killings predictable and inevitable. That should have been obvious to a former senator and constitutional law expert who knew, among other things, that the CIA had recently run an illegal torture program. We tortured some folks. The CIA then got carried away with the power to kill in secret in multiple countries. Obama couldn't foresee that. Don't worry, though. Once the leaks from The Intercept went public, Obama tightened restrictions on drone strikes so that they could not be used unless it was a near certainty that civilians would not be killed. You know, like he was supposed to have been doing anyway, according to international law. Anyway, seven months later, he authorized a strike on a Yemeni wedding procession that killed 15 people in direct violation of international law. The majority, if not all of whom, were almost certainly civilians. But even if there had been enemy combatants in the procession, it would still have been an illegal targeting of civilians. The White House denied involvement, but also insisted that everyone killed was a terrorist, a fact which survivors, including the bride who suffered severe facial wounds, dispute. Of course, they won't say who the terrorists were or how they knew they were terrorists, which by the by, is also illegal. Just take their word on that one. After all, if they were lying, why would they refuse to show you the evidence? Oh, I guess so that you wouldn't be able to tell that they're lying about the war crime they did. Now, I could spend the rest of this video outlining war crimes, but we have to move on to Obama's record on immigration, which is also dismal. You may have heard Obama referred to as the deporter-in-chief. His administration deported over 2.5 million people, more than the sum total of every president of the 20th century up to that point. Or did he? There's a bit more to the situation than the numbers suggest. So the process used to go like this. Border Patrol people, or ICE, or whichever jackboot is doing border control work, find an undocumented immigrant trying to get into the States. They send them back to their home country. This doesn't get written up as a deportation, it gets calculated as a voluntary return. They just volunteered to return after the fascists with guns showed up. The Bush administration changed the way things worked. 
when people were caught trying to cross the border quote-unquote illegally, instead of simply being returned to their home country, they could then be apprehended, charged with a crime, fingerprinted, and officially deported back to their country. This process is referred to as a removal as opposed to a return. Okay, so since the process for what did and did not count as an official deportation had changed, it is true that Obama did technically deport more people than his predecessors, but there's no way of knowing how many people his predecessors just informally returned that would have been counted as deportations under the new rules. So look, the numbers of deportations did accelerate a little bit when Obama came to office, but Obama made it his priority to deport criminals. Who wants a bunch of criminals around criminalizing everything? Stealing your jewels? But remember when I said that the Bush administration changed the rules so that people trying to enter the country illegally could be formally charged with a crime? And that they would be criminals? Do you see where this is going? It turns out that under the Obama administration, the amount of people charged this way greatly increased. And if you control for the amount of people charged with the crime of entering the United States illegally, the proportion of criminal to non-criminal deportation is the same as under the Bush administration. Meaning that no, the acceleration of deportations that occurred under Obama's watch compared to that of the Bush administration cannot be attributed to a focus on criminals, aside from people that the Obama administration decided to criminalize. About 20% of the people deported had been charged with a serious crime, like a drug crime. The rest had records for shit like the aforementioned immigration crimes, traffic violations, or nothing. Not crime. Crimant. While Obama campaigned against the tearing apart of families by ICE officers in 2008, in 2009, a democratically controlled Congress set a daily quota of holding 34,000 immigrants in ICE custody. ICE set a yearly goal of 400,000 deportations a year, necessitating the construction of new holding facilities. 70% of all ICE detainees were housed in private prisons, by the way. You know those concentration camps that Donald Trump is holding people in? They were built and maintained by the Obama administration for political expedience, with the same indifference for the well-being of detainees. According to a 2012 report by the Detention Watch Network, when the conditions at 10 ICE detention facilities were investigated, at all 10 of the facilities, people reported waiting weeks or months for medical care. Inadequate, and in some cases, a total absence of any outdoor recreation time or access to sunlight or fresh air. Minimal and inedible food. The use of solitary confinement as punishment, which, may I remind you, is torture. We tortured some folks. And the extreme remoteness of many of the facilities from any urban area, which makes access to legal services nearly impossible. Perhaps the most universal refrain of immigrants in ICE detention is the fear that complaining about their treatment or living conditions will provoke retaliation by guards or will negatively impact their immigration cases. Don't get me wrong, Donald Trump made this problem much worse, but he didn't cause it. He was enabled by the actions of his predecessor, who holds an equal share of the blame. By now, you're probably willing to admit that the Obama administration made some serious mistakes. You might quibble over some of the details. Maybe I even got some of the details wrong. Or you might not like the way that I've characterized those details. But I think it's pretty undeniable that mistakes were made and they were severe with lasting consequences. Still, you might say, whatever his faults, Obama did more good than harm. You're focusing on the bad things. What about his accomplishments? And it's true, every politician's legacy is mixed. Pobody's nerfed. As they say, we all have our foibles. I leave cupboard doors open. Obama kills a few hundred Pakistani civilians here and there. That doesn't mean he didn't do anything good. So let's be fair and look at some of Obama's accomplishments as well. Firstly, there's the Affordable Care Act, a policy that the former president is so synonymous with, most people only know it by the name Obamacare. You know Obamacare? Well, he is that Obama from that. The Affordable Care Act insured millions of Americans who were previously uninsured, giving them access to health care that they previously couldn't have afforded. Before the ACA, about 16% of people were uninsured, after only about 8%. 20 million adults received health care as a result of the ACA. And although it's not quite a public option, and there were a lot of problems with the way it was rolled out, it was a good thing for the American people. I mean, 
Obama often credits the conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, with the inspiration for several key aspects of this bill. And let's be honest, the whole thing was a compromise designed to ward off demand for a public option, and premiums didn't really go down for most people. So I don't know if it's a huge liberal victory, but it's, it's a big deal. It did help a lot of people. You know what would help more people is Medicare for all, because that would give everyone access to health care. That'd save millions of lives, especially right now in the middle of a pandemic. If only there was a candidate, an enormously popular candidate, who was running for president that could support that. Alas, there isn't, because Obama threw his weight behind his doofy sidekick and nudged the other guy out of the race. Ho hum. Hey, Obama got same-sex marriage legalized all by himself with no help. He urged the Supreme Court to overturn the ban on same-sex marriage. Good job, Mr. President. In fact, he supported gay marriage all the way back in 1996, when he was running for Illinois State Senate. But then his position evolved in time for the 2008 election, and he just supported civil union, but thought that marriage was between a man and a woman. But then, as public support for same-sex marriage grew, wouldn't you know it, but his position evolved again, and he supported gay marriage. Nice! It's almost like this isn't a matter of genuine principle for him, but rather, his position on the matter adapted to whatever was likely to give him more support, and therefore, power. Why does that matter, though? Who cares what's in the man's heart when he did the thing and it helped people? In this case, though, the credit might more rightly go to the thousands of activists who forced his hand. The people who made support for this issue non-negotiable. Obama was just the president at the right historical moment to capitalize on it. So good job, Obama. You managed to get out of the way and let progress happen. He normalized relations with Cuba, but then the next guy unnormalized them, so... Whoop de doo He was president when Osama bin Laden died, but like, it's not like he went in with a machine gun and did it himself. Do you think if someone else had been president, they would have decided not to kill Osama bin Laden? He extended civil rights protections to LGBTQ plus people. That's something. We got a good thing there. Nothing bad to say about that one. He did a good thing. Let it not be said, I didn't give him credit for the good thing. Look, I don't have the time to go into every single thing that Obama did, good or bad. He was president for eight years, and I'm not a presidential scholar. I'm some blowjob on YouTube. He did a lot of stuff, so I'm going to leave things out. But it should be clear that this man is not to be celebrated. He's a mass-murdering Wall Street crony whose best accomplishments were either luck or desperate attempts to forestall something better happening. He allowed Wall Street to dictate his financial policy, moments after they had just gotten done turbo-fucking the economy. He set the precedent that the president could unilaterally decide who was to be killed via extrajudicial drone murders, including U.S. citizens. He set the precedent that ICE should maintain a quota of deportations and gave them the go-ahead to massively expand their detention facilities. Then he handed the keys over to the incompetent fascists that seceded him, and the litany of competent fascists that guide his tiny-fingered little hand. We wouldn't be in this mess if it weren't for the choices he made. We all have to live with the consequences and their impact on the imperial hegemon who keeps us all under their thumb. He might look cute in a photo with a kid where he's doing little Spider-Man webs, but he still gave Donald Trump the final say on whether or not a Hellfire missile could blow up your wedding and kill your family. So what else can we say? Thanks, Obama. Oh, I almost forgot the prison program. So, okay, in 2013, Edward Snowden leaked information that showed that a secret surveillance program on American citizens had been ongoing since 2007. The government had their eyes everywhere. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's not funny. It's just, imagine that. Eyes everywhere. <laughs> a thousand eyes glimmering, gleaming. So beautiful. We could all live there if we would all just surrender. Hello and welcome to the Eyeball Zone. Here in the Eyeball Zone, we promote small leftist content creators who need eyeballs on their work, and then their fate is sealed. Those friggin' leftists out there ruining Obama for me? I thought the left was supposed to be about tolerance. Well, tough nuggies, bud, because here comes Kalen Conrad to disprove that idea in their video, The Tolerant Left. Turns out tolerance is actually bad. Who knew? 
Karl Popper knew that. He knew that. It's seldom that I watch a video for the eyeball zone and then I think to myself, oh no, I'm out of a job. I'm ruined. But I definitely got the feeling watching this one. This video is so funny, so nice to look at, and perfectly argued and edited that, I mean, just go watch it. That's why I do these eyeball things. So you go look at this stuff. Go do it. Do you have a small leftist project you'd like to see featured here in the eyeball zone? Send me no more than one email with the word eyeball somewhere in the subject line and pertinent details such as your pronouns and where to actually find the damn thing you want me to feature because Jesus Christ, why would you not even send me a link? And maybe you will find yourself trapped here in the eyeball zone. All jokes aside, though, PRISM represents a disgusting breach of civil liberties. You should absolutely be outraged about it. Who oh boy, thanks for watching another Thought Slime video. I know you love them, I love making them, so it's great that they're here you are. Okay, uh, here's some things I want you to do. Could you like the video? Could you subscribe to me? Great, I would love that. Also, if you want more videos, check out youtube.com slash scaredycatstv. That's where I talk about horror movies every 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesdays. Maybe you want to see me play video games? You can do that on youtube.com slash megaslime entertainment zone, where I upload new content most of the time every day on a bit of a break right now because I'm going through a lot of stuff. I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash thoughtslime where I am supported by all of, the, all of my lovely patrons, some of whom you're seeing drawings of scroll by now. You can catch my live streams every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on YouTube and Twitch. And lastly, you can, you can wash your hands and wear a mask every time you go outside and help us contain this dang coronavirus. Can you do that for me? Thought slime? Can you do it for me? Please?